Hello, Houston. We're just sitting here reminiscing about all that good food we had on the screen last time, so we'll go ahead and just start with that today and let you continue drooling like you were at the end of the last lecture. We're going to finish our tour of physiological motives today and hopefully get on into um, some of the mixed and uncertain motives, and maybe if we're especially lucky, even start looking at the learned motives. In any case, we had just reached the point where what I was going to do was to use hunger as the sample physiological motive. So we're not, we're not going to cover thirst and we won't cover a number of the motives, but what we will do is use several of them as, as samples of, of what each of these different levels of motives operate like, um, the manner in which they operate. First of all, if we look at hunger, we can talk about and isolate the factors that lead to hunger or produce it. And they basically are divisible, like many other things in psychology, into two major groups. The physiological factors that lead to hunger are very easy to identify. You are almost, given your age, done with one of the three, and that is that we eat for purposes of growth. Um, once you finish bone growth by your middle 20s, you're then done with that particular uh, interest. We also, however, eat for purposes of repair. Anytime we break a bone or scratch ourselves or anything like that, it takes a certain amount of energy and nutrients to repair ourselves. And thirdly, we eat for simple storage of reserves. That's probably the major reason why we, why we do eat. So there are a number of, of physiological factors which, um, which will in fact um, uh, impact our, our desire to eat. But there are also then a certain number of learned factors. For instance, just the odor or sight of food, as we were looking at it a minute ago, um, will cause you in some cases to salivate, particularly if you're watching this tape just prior to when you really wanted to be eating anyway. Now I've got you salivating. Thanksgiving, you and I do the same kind of thing. Uh, we, we inhale the aroma for hours before we actually get to eat that delicious turkey. And in essence, that aroma becomes classically conditioned as, as an elicitor of, of salivation and all the good thoughts that are associated with food. Even the sight of food can get us to salivate. One of my favorite experiments involved uh, taking a bunch of chickens in a barnyard and putting in front of them a stack of food that was appropriate for what they would normally eat. That is, these were done one chicken at a time. And the chicken would peck away at that food and, and then uh, exit happy. Then what they did was to take the same chickens and put a huge amount of food in front of them and then what they did was to eat more than they needed. So they waddled away from the, uh, from the food. So just the sight of food, in some instances, is enough to get us eating. Certainly cafeterias know that. Any commercial cafeteria is not going to show you the bottom of a steam tray. They're going to have food in every single opening there to give you a maximum stimulation to what you might end up eating. Second factor that also impacts whether we, we um, have, have cues that, that impact the likelihood that we'll learn, is prior experience. The, the whole idea of setting the table is an example of a cue that is related to um, the likelihood that we will eat. That act normally precipitates or precedes very briefly the actual eating. At, at Thanksgiving, we do ourselves up proud because then we get out china and silverware and goblets and candelabra and everything that hasn't that has always been associated with big meals in our, um, in our experience. And, and the net effect is, sure enough, we start salivating and anticipating that meal in, in very significant ways. But there are other things. Even the time of day also will impact how much we salivate. If you stupidly decide to lose weight by simply skipping meals, the net result will be that you're going to be hungriest at the time that you would normally be eating. And if you can get past that, then you'll be OK till, till the next meal. Um, but there are also, beyond that, we've talked about odor or sight of food and prior experience. There are also environmental conditions that will impact um, how hungry we get. You and I will consume more calories on a cold day than we will on a hot day, simply because our body needs more calories to maintain the, the 98.6, give or take, that we normally um, are, are associated with. Um, so when we look at hunger, basically, we um, one of the things that's rather interesting is that, that as much as we talk about hunger and the hunger drive, I know of only a very limited number of studies, nay, say one, that has ever been done involving starvation. And this was a study that was done using conscientious objectors back during the, the latter part of the Second World War and the Korean conflict back around the, the middle part of the century. What they did here was to convince about 30 uh, soldiers, um, you know, late teens, early 20s, males in their late teens, early 20s, to participate in a study that basically involved three different phases and stretched out over 48 weeks. So it was actually quite a lengthy study. During phase one, the only limit was that anything that was eaten had 
had to be recorded. And in order to make sure that that happened, these men were actually contained in, in a well-defined area and could not leave. But they could eat. I mean, the cafeteria was running 24 hours a day for them. They could have anything they wanted, anytime they wanted, as long as it was noted by the nutritionists when they ate it. Phase one. In phase two, what then happened was that they were t the, the phase one data was used to, to establish a base rate of how many calories they needed to maintain themselves at a given weight. That was then cut by approximately 30%. So where the average um, um, soldier was consuming about 23 or 2400 calories a day, now all of a sudden they were getting along on 1570 calories a day. And it was still all being written down, but clearly from the soldier's perspective, there wasn't enough being eaten. And some rather interesting changes occurred. In the initial stage, less than 50% of the calories that were consumed were actually utilized to maintain basic body metabolism. That is, the operation of the body was, was uh, consumed less than 50% of the calories, and more than half of their calories were engaged, were utilized to, to fund or underwrite voluntary physical activity, whether it was uh, sports or sex or active communications, you name it. But they, you know, they just did the, the normal array of, of human male things, late teens, early 20s. In phase two, when the caloric intake began to drop, the body gradually reallocated its resources so that by the end of that phase, um, they were down to um, very little physical activity. Sexual activity ceased and um, decreased markedly. There was rampant apathy, and there was very little participation in active sports, which had been very dominant earlier. Things like basketball and so forth absolutely disappeared. They just didn't do it anymore. And so in essence, what happened was that the body massively reallocated calorie intake. And now, approximately 60% of the calories were being used just to maintain basic body resources, basic body metabolism. Less than a third, in fact, less than 30% of the calories were going to any kind of voluntary physical activity. So the body, in fact, did reallocate resources when not enough were coming in. The tragic, <laughs> two things are kind of tragic about this. One was that food became the dominant theme of conversation. <laughs> if we can't have it, at least we can talk about it and make ourselves feel even worse. But the other thing was that, that cognitive skills, because they tested a full array of things, cognitive skills like reasoning and math skills and so forth were basically unimpacted. The tragedy of that, of course, is that next time you see a picture of somebody who's starving to death anywhere in the world, you can be aware that they are fully aware of the condition that they're in. And in some ways, that is, of course, exactly as we'd want it. That is, that the brain has top draw on the assignment of, of limited numbers of calories, which is necessary. I mean, that's the, the organ that runs everything else, the system that runs everything else. So you really can't cut calories there, or bizarre things might begin to happen. Finally, then, in the last phase of this study, they went back into a 12-week rehabilitation period, where under medical supervision, they were brought back to the original weights that they, had, that they had been at. Now, that leads us to a fairly basic question, and that is, why do we start eating? I mean, what causes hunger? What gets us to start eating? One of the oldest guesses of this, and one that probably leaped to your mind immediately, was, well, I get hunger pains. I feel hungry. Well, if you can believe this, an investigator actually convinced his graduate students to feed a rubber hose down their throat to which a balloon was attached. And when the balloon reached the stomach, what they did was to reattach the hose to an air pump, a bicycle air pump. And they puffed up the balloon. And then they took the hose and attached it to a measuring device. And in essence, what that device, as diagrammed here, would measure is the contractions of the stomach. That is, every time the stomach contracted, the muscles tightened around the balloon. The balloon put air pressure on the hose. And the hose, in fact, was connected to the apparatus so that the needle moved on a chymograph kind of uh, turning device. And the investigator's canon, after, after studying this in 1934, was convinced that contractions, in fact, are correlated with hunger pangs. Uh, so that contractions are, are what he was basically arguing would, would, um, would elicit eating. The problem with that took several years to spell out. But it became obvious that, that one of the solutions for cancer of the stomach is, in radical cases, that you end up having to operate and remove the stomach. Well, it turns out patients who have had their stomach surgically removed still eat. Not only that, they still get hungry. So in fact, the stomach cannot be the primary source of stimulation because people who've had their stomach surgically removed so that the esophagus connects directly to the, to the upper intestine still eat and still exhibit all the normal signs of hunger. A second problem with this is, is a little bit more complex, but just as obvious, I think, when it's pointed out. And that is that, that 
one of the reasons stomachs contract at all is because it's actually a muscle movement that moves the food from the stomach into the upper intestine to continue the process of, of digestion. And here, in fact, we've created a kind of an awkward mechanism. That is, if it is the case that hunger pangs or stomach contractions lead to eating, what you've created is an irreversible cycle. Because the first time at age zero that your stomach contracts, you eat, which then makes your stomach contract, which makes you eat, which then makes your stomach contract. And in fact, you're in an irreversible, ever escalating spiral. So that clearly can't be the case. And the third element is that, that the, the, the third criticism I would register against this study is that in all of psychology, this is probably one of the best examples of where the process of measurement actively interferes with that which we are measuring. Does it not seem reasonable that somebody's stomach would probably be contracting quite a bit if you've got a tube up your throat and a balloon in your tummy? So that just the very process of measuring stomach contractions there has actively hindered um, the process that we're really trying to measure. There are, however, a number of other factors that do turn out to contribute to, to the likelihood, first of all, that we get hungry, and secondly, that we, um, that we eat. One of these is blood sugar level. Um, if we bathe your hypothalamus in, in low blood sugar, or let me put it another way, in blood that is carrying very little um, sugar within it, the net result will be that you will get hungry. That is, low blood sugar will in fact precipitating eating and in fact will be contributing to make you ravenously hungry. But the, art, the opposite of that is not true. That is, if we bathe a, a rat's hypothalamus or yours in a highly sugar-laden blood, it does not stop eating. And that's one of the reasons that diabetics like me sometimes have trouble. I have over the years probably taken more insulin than I should and so the result is that when blood sugar drops, I get hungry and I eat and the insulin is there to put the sugar away, to store it as energy. And so I am constantly fighting a weight problem um, to keep the blood sugar low enough so that I'm, in, I'm in, a, in a healthy range, but not so low as to get unduly hungry. And the problem is that if your blood sugar goes up, there's no incentive to stop eating. All the other factors, habits that we've already talked about will kick in and keep you eating. So blood sugar is a, is a kind of a double-edged sword. It lower and it gets you eating, but raised does not get you to stop eating. We're gonna have to rely on some other things for that. Another thing, and I'm, I'm not going to go into the detail on this, plasma-free fatty acids and lipids have also been um, implicated in, in what goes on. Um, the, um, the other kind of factors that also impact us are, are it, one of them was the subject of a really goofy experiment. What they did was to take two rats and link them surgically. So essentially they created what are called parabiotic rats, but they essentially operated to link the circulatory system of two rats. And they just put them together side by side and linked their blood system. Once they were cured, um, the theory went that what they were going to do was to feed one of the rats and see whether in fact this would introduce a factor into the blood which would cause the other rat not to eat. Well, lo and behold, they fed the, one of the two rats randomly selected, and he got bigger and bigger, and the other one gradually wasted away, atrophied, and eventually died. And it was only after the fact, when they had concluded, well, obviously there is a blood factor, that somebody pointed out, well, wait a minute, you didn't blood type match those rats. And it turned out they hadn't. So that, in fact, what was really going on there was simply the, the survival of the fittest. I mean, literally, it was, it was a fight between the two systems as to which alien body, which invading body, i.e. the other body, was going to be defeated. And the rat which gained energy, and as soon as the energy balance favored one rat, that rat's destructive system, you know, disease destructing system, was going to ultimately dominate. And that was what really, um, really accounted for it. So there's been a, a range of factors that we've looked at um, down through the... Um, down through the years. The parabiotics were not a particularly helpful um, group for us. But one of the other areas that we do now know is implicated in eating is our hypothalamus, especially the lateral hypothalamus, meaning the side of, of the hypothalamus itself. That is now widely identified as what is called a feeding center. If you electrically stimulate the lateral hypothalamus in a rat, it will eat. And it goes so far as to the fact that if, if a rat has been food deprived for 23 hours and then is released of food and gets to eat, if when it's done and backs away from the cage, you then stimulate the lateral hypothalamus, it'll go back and eat half again um, what it has just finished eating. I mean, when it's eaten to its own satisfaction, activate the lateral hypothalamus and it will eat more. By contrast, if we ablate, if we remove the lateral hypothalamus, the rat will literally starve to death. You know, that is, you have to force feed the rat at that point. So for both purposes, we've pretty well identified that the lateral hypothalamus does cause eating to occur. It is an eating center. 
There is, it turns out, a second area of the brain, and I'm just reminding you here where the hypothalamus is actually located, kind of dead center in the head. There is a second area of the brain called the ventromedial hypothalamus, which is the under middle part of the hypothalamus, which turns out to serve as a satiety center. That is, it gets active when the organism gets satiated. And the net result there is that if you stimulate the ventromedial hypothalamus, a rat will typically stop eating. Now the evidence is a little bit more constricted in this situation because of the fact that there is some evidence that this is simply an attention getter uh, and that it may simply deflect the rat's attention. But the basic research does seem to indicate that if you stimulate the ventral medial hypothalamus, then what happens is a rat will, will, um, will stop eating. Um, so that if you, if you um, when the rat gets up to the 23 hours food de deprived, the rat gets up to the food box or the source of food and you stimulate that, it'll just, uh, the, the ventral medial hypothalamus, it'll just sit down and start licking its paw instead. There is some evidence that it is simply distracted, but in any case, firing up the, the ventral medial hypothalamus causes a rat to do other things than eat. Even more convincing, however, is the fact that if you ablate, if you, if you eliminate the ventral medial hypothalamus, then what you have is a rat that never stops eating. There is one classic picture in the literature of a, of a 120 day old, a four month old rat tipping the scales at a little over two and a half, almost three pounds. That is a rat normally at, at 120 days will weigh about 120 grams, about a quarter of a pound. This one actually tipped the scales at 1,080 grams, nine times its normal weight after, after um, four months of living. Now, you get the feeling there that you've created the rat that's going to eat New York, but in fact what happened was that the weight actually stabilized at about that point, and there are other factors that kick in and it doesn't go beyond that, but it was a very rotund rat. So basically we suggest that the lateral hypothalamus is the feeding center, the ventral medial hypothalamus is the satiety center, and what you've got is a very delicate balance between those two that really governs how much we actually eat. If you ablate both, we stop eating. But the, the bottom line question does seem to be, or the, the, the bottom line conclusion is that the lateral hypothalamus controls eating, the ventral medial hypothalamus controls the lateral hypothalamus and the stopping of eating. The, um, that was another point I was going to make there and it just went right out my head. It'll come back to me and I'll think of it in a minute. Um, we have a lot of work still to be done in this, uh, in this area. There is, however, another important question. Oh, I know what I was going to say. It is not enough just to get you to start eating. It is also important to get you to stop eating. If you overeat as much as one pat of butter a day, you will weigh 10 pounds more in a year. That's how delicate we, we balance our caloric intake each day. And you really have to, because when you ingest food, if it doesn't go for repair or stored energy or, or growth, it's gonna, it's, it's gonna end up as stored energy. Um, that is, you will, some way those calories are going to have to be expended, either stored as fat or expended in terms of, of ongoing needs. So the bottom line is that we've got an equally important question motivationally, and that is how do we get you to stop eating? There are a variety of long-term cues that will accumulate here as I describe for you the short-term cues. Those are the ones that are, that are more immediate. Number one is the mouth. In general, if we let you eat a meal, the amount that you chew is one of the cues that you use to determine when it is time to stop eating. And this was demonstrated in a kind of a devastating but interesting experiment. What they did was to operate on the esophagus of dogs and attach a U-shaped tube to the throat of the dog. So the dog was simply mated to this, this U-shaped tube, which tube could be removed. And so what they did after the dog had, had, had recovered from the operation was then to release him, 23 hours food deprive him, and then release him to a, a food source and measure what happens. And what happens is the dog eats about what it would normally eat and then turns away and does something else. But it turns out in about another 30 minutes it comes back and will again eat about what it would normally eat and then turn away. And it gets onto a cycle. When all the food is just dumping into a sack collecting on its chest, it will come back and eat about a normal amount of food about every 30 minutes, leading us to suspect then that the amount of activity that we use for our mouth is one of the things that determines how much we end up, um, we end up eating. Now we've got all this pre-chewed food that has saliva in it. Let's load it into the tummy directly and see what happens under different circumstances. And what happens then is that the dog, you know, so the dog is 23 hours food deprived. You then load the food directly into the mouth and release the dog. It will go over to the food tray and eat about what it would normally eat, half as much. So in other words, it'll eat about 50% again of what it would have otherwise eaten. 
the bed is here, the, the circumstance is here, that apparently what's happening is that now the load on the tummy kicks in. So the load on the tummy is, is still a relatively short-term factor, but it is longer term than the amount of chewing that you've done with your mouth. That is, your mouth will normally have you stop before your stomach has reached true capacity. But the stomach itself will signal. And that's probably what causes us at Thanksgiving. I mean, when you say, I really can't eat another bite, you're true. I mean, you're speaking truth there. There may not be any more room in your stomach by this, um, by this point. Um, so those are the two things that, that um, the, the chewing and the, the load on the stomach that tend to produce, um, tend to lead us to stop eating. In turn, each of those factors which operates over about a 30 minute cycle is enough to allow the more long term processes like uh, blood sugar level uh, and so forth to readjust themselves so that in the, the problem is a two stage thing. Short term we need to get you to stop eating and then long term readjust the internal uh, blood sugar and, and uh, blood factors so that, so that you will in fact keep um, away from, from eating. Which leads then to yet another question and that is um, can we actually diet? Is there a process by which we can actively voluntarily control this? Well, the answer is yes and no. One of the problems that's operating against us is the fact that if you eat and you eat too much, new fat cells are created. That is, the energy is simply stored as, as, um, as fat cells and, and we will create new fat cells. When we, when we diet, when we start losing weight, we do not lose fat cells. So what happens is that when you eat, you add fat cells. When you try to diet, you don't lose them. And instead, what happens is every fat cell gives up a little bit. And then what happens is pretty soon when you, when you start getting hungry because you're dieting, it's happening because every fat cell in your body is screaming for more food. So losing weight is not as easy as putting it on by any means. Because what happens is the, the evidence suggests that you have to reset at a lower weight. That is, you have to, if you want to lower your average body weight, you have to take the weight off and then hold it there for as much as two to three years before the, the excess fat cells will slough, um, you know, be lost, and then you can, the body will reset to that lower weight. There's a second factor, however, that also contributes, and that is digestive efficiency. In the New England Journal of Medicine, just within the last couple of years, it's been announced that, that, um, that what actually we now know is that when you start losing weight, what happens is that the efficiency of your digestive system goes up. So if you're eating enough or too much, the digestive system gets rather lazy and will simply take off the easy calories, take off the ones that it needs. But what happens is if you start cutting your diet, if you start actively trying to lose weight by cutting your food, what happens is the efficiency of the digestive system increases. And I rather strongly suspect that that's what creates what we oftentimes refer to as the yo-yo diet. In essence, um, Oprah Winfrey has, has gained some fame a couple of times where she announces she's going to lose weight and she loses it. And then we look at her three or four or five months later and the weight is back. So you take it off, you put it on. You take it off, you put it on. And you're on what's called the yo-yo diet, essentially. That's probably happening because many of the, of the widely available diet programs cut calories. But what they don't do is include advice on the, on the necessity of actually cutting calories a second time to keep the weight off. And Jenny Craig, for instance, not to pick any particular name, is, is caught between a rock and a hard place because they make money the more food they sell you. So you really kind of wonder, are, are they trying to sell food to get you to lose weight or trying to sell food to stay rich, which means you're going to get fatter. Uh, and I don't know how that actually comes out. But most of the programs I've seen that are programmed long-term weight losses don't take into account the, the relatively new data that, in fact, our, uh, our digestive processes get more efficient um, the, the, the more weight we lose. One final thing I want to look at that, that actually involves the, the use of, of the physiological motives um, is the use of a lie detector. A lie detector actually measures typically four things. Galvanic skin response, which is a measure of electrical conductivity, and then in addition, a res respiration upper and lower. So there is, for instance, a, um, when, we, when we measure your respiration rate, there is first of all an upper band that is put around just under your armpits to measure what is called upper chest breathing, and then there's a second one that's put in down around your waist. And we do breathe differently in those two areas. If you're scared and trying to be quiet, that's upper chest breathing that you use. If you just run 500 yards and you need to get some air in, then it's lower chest breathing that you're using. So we measure both. And with the, um, 
we ran a demonstration once. I tried to get it set up today, but we weren't able to do it because of the absence of equipment and personnel to run it. But we ran a demonstration one time where a, a police officer came in with a lie detector, and he had with him a deck of cards, and he asked the, the um, female student who was doing it to draw one of the cards, not show it to the, to the person administering the lie detector test, and then put it back in the deck. And then the administrator laid the cards out on the on the desk, and he, he showed us the the um, the measurement of, of the the four skins the uh, four skins the four things I'll put back on the screen for you here. Um, but all of those were being measured on the screen, and in essence, what he did was to tell her, "I'm going to ask you point blank, did you draw?" And I'm going to name each of the five cards. What I want you to do is to say no to all five cards. So in one instance, you're going to have to lie. And then he had the cards laid out on the table. And he would pick up one, and he'd say, did you char choose card? And he'd name the number that was on the card. And she would say no. And he did that for each of the five cards. And we watched what happened to the needles on the screen. Then he went back and turned off everything but the galvanic skin response and went back through the cycle again without moving the card. So it was very obvious that what he was doing was cueing her, I'm going to ask you in this order. And he then picked up each card and said, did you? And it turned out it was the second card. And the way he knew that was that the galvanic skin response, which is the most sensitive of those measures, um, dropped precipitously after the second card. And what he said basically in describing it was that in essence what had happened was that she knew after she did the first card, she still knew she had to lie. So the pressure was still on her. But once she got through the second card, she had lied and then she knew, given the order in which I'm going to ask the question, she knew that she could tell the truth the rest of the way through and she then relaxed. And the net result was that he nailed her. Now the problem is that a lie detector can be used in either of two ways. That is, you can, if you've got a cooperating subject, you're fine. We can, we can detect lies, but we can manipulate it. And that's the reason lie detector evidence is not admissible in most courts of law. Because you can, you can overcome it, you can defeat it in either of two ways. First of all, don't eat anything and don't sleep for two days before they question you. And then everything is so muted that it won't work. You know, the system is, is unreactive. Or go the opposite route. Get two or three great nights of sleep, drink two or three cups of caffeinated coffee, have an extra glass of orange juice, and then go in there and they say good morning to you, and all four needles go right off the screen. Um, so in either case, you know, it is ultimately up to the subject. With a cooperator, we can, in fact, we can detect lying. But when they're not cooperating, we don't have a mechanism that we can plug in and say, oh, that's a liar. Um, so because of that, we, we're not able to use these, um, these tests. Now, let's get into the mixed or uncertain motives. And I want to pick up the pace a little bit because I want to finish this today. Um, in essence, the mixed or uncertain motives are, are several in number. Pain, I'm going to come back and describe this slide a little bit later here. Uh, sex is, is the other motive that we're going to talk about here a little bit. But there are several other things related to sex that we, that we will talk about, among which is much of what we call sex is actually learned. As a, which may surprise you. We've got maternal and paternal uh, instincts or, or motives among the, among the mixed group. Uh, the, the duties of mom are, are many and multiple. Um, we've got activity, we've got curiosity and manipulation, and we've got stimulation, other examples of, of mixed motives. Have you ever stood next to the Texas Cyclone over at Astro World and listened? Other than machinery, what is the main thing you hear? Screams, Screams. exactly. Our world these days is so calm and so, so well regulated that we actively pay money to get stimulation out of things like roller coasters. And they design them now to go faster, drop further, sh turn sharper, all to increase the stimulation. Junior high schoolers, I figure, are the worst. When they get done riding, they get up, tear out the door, go around to the front gate, come in to ride again to be terrified more. I'm going to work a deal with you. If you've got younger sisters or brothers who have 25 or 30 bucks to, to spend, to waste, on, on, not waste, to, to enjoy at Astroworld, send them to me and I will scare the bejesus out of them. Take their money. They'll be happy. We'll be rich and you and I will split the take 50-50. Okay? All it is is the need for, for active stimulation. I can provide that for them if necessary. Scare them, do whatever's necessary, but we'll get the money. They'll be thrilled. It's a win-win. Everybody comes out ahead on this. I see no problems with that possible um, strategy. Now, let's look first of all at pain as, as an exemplar motive. There are a couple of different components to pain. I'm telling you things you already know, but I just want to spell these out to make sure you understand. There is first of all the ouch. That's the motivational part of pain. 
And then there is also the information as to what's actually hurt, where it's located, and how bad the damage actually is. It turns out that there are two different signal systems that, that are reporting this information to us when we hurt ourselves. One of these is what's called the FAST system. You will remember, let me remind you, in the physiology section of the course, we talked about the fact that myelinated fibers conduct messages more rapidly than do non-myelinated fibers. So those fibers that have a fatty sheath wrapped around the axon will conduct signals faster. And the net result is that if you're walking across campus or anywhere and stub your toe, there are two messages that leave your toe. One is on the fast nervous system, <coughs> and in essence, that serves an alerting function. It goes to the midbrain and arouses the brain. That is, it serves an alerting function for the brain itself. And then that's followed by the, uh, the slow messages on the, on the, the non-myelinated fiber system. And that system carries the details of what's been hurt, where it's located, how bad the damage is, and so forth. So it is actually both systems that are used to conduct the, the, um, the messages on the pain system. Ronald Melzack in, in, um, in Canada um, came up with the explanation that sticks, the, the one that seems to explain what's going on. He proposed, in essence, what is called the gate theory of pain. And what Melzack is arguing here is that you and I have a lot of different routes that report pain to the, to the central processor. It turns out that processor has only one exit channel. That is, given the way it's set up, you and I can process pain in only one part of the body at any given time. And that is what allows us to provide an explanation, for instance, for acupuncture. That acupuncture works exactly because you lay somebody out on the, um, on the table. And if you've ever seen a film of somebody being acupunctured, when they're laid out on the table, there may be 50 or 100 different needles stuck into them along the body. Well, you're thinking to yourself, I can handle that. I mean, a pinprick of pain is not that bad. I could get used to that. No. No, what the acupuncturist is doing is going around continuously twisting those needles to make sure they hurt. There are very delicate maps linking particular sites of the body to you know, where you put needles in to suppress pain in various areas. But Melzack's theory suggests that, in fact, the gate theory is the underlying explanation for what's going on. And that is that you and I can only process pain through one channel at a time, which may explain, for instance, why it is that pro athletes sometimes come off the field after a, after a very intense contest and discover, oh, gee, I broke my hand or my foot or something else. And that what it's telling us, first of all, is that they're playing under a huge amount of pain normally anyway and that the minor annoyance of a broken toe just doesn't really register on their, uh, on their scale. But in essence, that's the, the gate theory of pain that is actually um, that's operating in that, um, in that case. Um, beyond that, um, we can also look at the fact that there are some learned factors. I mean, what I've described so far is, is the, the, the physiological, the inherited mechanisms. Learning also turns out to be crucial. One of the other experiments that Melzack did involved taking some Scottish Terriers and raising them in isolation. Um, for in a, in a cage that was totally rounded, that is, it had thick rubber pads on it, and that what they did was to design the most wound-free, painless environment they could possibly create, and raise these uh, Scottish Terriers in isolation in these cages uh, for a period of, of a number of months. And then they were removed from the cage, and a variety of different tests were performed on them. One of the most compelling and revealing was the fact that when you strike a match in front of any dog, it will walk up and try to sniff it. And if you're not careful, it'll end up burning its nose. Well, they tried that with these Scottish Terriers, and in fact, they did the predicted. They walked up and sniffed it and burned their nose. What was amazing was that for any other dog raised normally, you strike the second match, and that dog leaves the county. It wants nothing to do with that, with that flame. Not so with these Scottish Terriers. Strike the match, they'd sniff it again, and again, and again, and again. Over and over and over, they would, they would burn themselves. And they, they, it was just very clear that there was no ouch to the pain. From which the conclusion that has subsequently been drawn is that we do, in fact, you and I have a critical period during which it is necessary that we hurt. That is, we have to experience pain in order to understand what the information is that's being provided to us and what to do about it. So that, in fact, the learning component is, is vital to our understanding how pain operates. One of the operations that can be performed, and we're going to talk about this more in, in the section on psychotherapy later on in the, in the uh, course, is what's called a frontal lobotomy. One of the effects of that is to eliminate sensitivity to pain. 
I met a, um, a cancer patient a number of years ago at the Veterans Hospital in Columbia, South Carolina. I used to teach many years ago at, at USC in, in Columbia, the main campus there. Um, he, had, he was in there for, for terminal cancer. That is, he was ultimately going to succumb to it. But the pain medications, had, you know, he'd been under treatment so long that the pain medications simply no longer suppressed the pain. And the result was that he was constantly subjected to pain all the time. And he was ultimately offered the option of having a frontal lobotomy performed where the very front part of the frontal lobe is simply severed from the rest of the head. And the net result was that his sensitivity, the ouch part of pain, was removed. And when you asked him afterwards how he felt, that's the way he summarized it on screen. It hurts just as bad now, it just doesn't bother me. And in essence what he's done there is to define the entirety of the gate theory of pain that you've removed the ouch, but the information about what's hurt and where it's located is still there and still available to you. Now, let's look at sex. That's a separate motive from pain, by the way. There are several similarities that we can talk about relative to, um, to sex and the physiological motives. For instance, both of them involve um, physiological mechanisms in, in their expression and in their, their release or, or relief. Secondly, intensity of the motive varies with the incentive value of the goal. That is, you will work harder to date an attractive person than you will an ugly person. Same way you'll work harder for, for a good meal than you will for a lousy meal. Thirdly, the sex act requires instrumental acts before the, the motive is satisfied. And finally, sex can be viewed as an approach motive rather than an avoidance motive. It is like hunger and thirst, something where we approach the goal object rather than, than trying to move away from it. There are, however, several differences that we can cite. First of all, and I know this is going to be stressful, there is no physiological need for sex. Okay? Deprivation does not result in death. Now, I know that's going to mess up a lot of standard Saturday night lines, but, but bear with me. We don't have deprivations in those areas. Now, one of the differences that is interesting is that, that satisfaction of the sex drive results from what is called a catabolic process rather than an anabolic process. And by that, what I mean is that the organism is stronger, when, I'm sorry, is weaker when the sex drive has been satisfied, not stronger. And that's the only drive for which that's true, okay? So it is unique in, in that way. Fourthly, as we're going to see here, particularly as you move higher in the animal hierarchy, it is very and increasingly dependent on environmental stimuli. And finally, it is a very complex drive. It is among the most complex drives we have because of, particularly in humans, because of the three different areas in which we um, draw stimulation or incentives to engage in sex. First of all, we can look at the physiological determinants of sex, and there are several. There are, first of all, the basic primitive neurological circuits. A male, for instance, whose, whose uh, spinal cord has been severed at the waist is still capable of both erection and ejaculation um, because there's no brain activity involved in that. That is purely a reflexive act on the part of a male. Secondly, we know the brain does play a role because of the popularity of magazines like um, Playboy, penthouse for males and increasingly um, playgirl for, for females. Those are widely recognized, certainly by males, as, as um, external stimulation sources for, for masturbation. So the head is clearly involved and in this one I mean. Thirdly, um, when we look at, at, um, at lower animals, the, the male's role in terms of brain cells reflected is, is much more complex because the male body has to do more things in order for the sex act to be, to be um, accomplished uh, successfully. That ratio evens out more as you move up the, the animal hierarchy. Um, fourthly, um, and I guess I've already talked about higher animals, um, the, the, the point I was going to make, I got to kind of confuse myself by changing screens there, is that in the higher animals, uh, the cortex plays an increasingly important role the higher up you go in the animal hierarchy. Secondly, if we look at hormonal factors, there are several that we can note. One is the fact that, that the entire control of all sexual behavior from birth to puberty in humans is controlled entirely by hormones, and that's all. Um, and for females, it extends, hormonal control extends even into menstruation and the actual staging of, of menopause. Um, testosterone in the body, the ratio of testosterone in, in the womb basically accounts for the development of male sex organs in the embryo as opposed to female sex organs. So that is another hormonal factor that impacts uh, sex um, 
quite directly in that case. As we move up the phylogenetic scale, the reliance on, on hormones declines steadily. In a mouse, um, if the female is not at the receptive point in her, recept in her estrus cycle, the male cannot under any condition convince her to have sex. For monkeys, the Don Juan among monkeys could convince a female to have sex at, at other than the normal time during her estrus cycle. In humans, where the female is in, in, her, uh, in her cycle has no impact at all on her receptivity to uh, sex. Um, or sexual advances. There may be social reasons for wanting or not wanting to, to have sex at a, at a particular time in the cycle, but there is no internal hormonally driven reason why a female human won't be receptive at any time during the cycle. Probably the best point to, to make here is that essentially hormones predispose us to, to sexual activity, but they do not, at least for humans, actually precipitate the activity. That relies on environmental events. One of the things we know, for instance, is that, that most of our experience with sex and the, the precipitation of the, of, the, of the act is learned. The link between flowers and sex, learned. The links between, hormo between uh, cologne or, or perfume and sex, learned. The link between a good Saturday night date and sex, learned. The link between a good meal and sex, learned. The link between music or no music, light or dark, comfortable bed or uncomfortable bed, and sex, all learned. Which leads to the fact that what I would suggest is that we are the only organism on the face of the earth where learned factors override the cumulative effects of both hormones and physiology. Witness the fact that I'm willing to bet lunch money that when you get home tonight, you are not going to find your parents laid out on the linoleum engaged in hot, passionate sex in the kitchen. That's purely a product of environment. Hormonally, physiologically, it could certainly happen, but it won't. It is simply because of the learning, the traditions that we, that we, uh, that we have with, with relation to sex activity. The very idea that your parents have sex makes you creepy crawly, doesn't it? Maybe they're at home on the kitchen floor right now. Well. Thirdly, the work of Harlow with the monkeys has led to significant understanding in, in the importance of the affectional bond that we humans normally share when the sex act is engaged in. One of the things that you and I learn in sex play as children is the fact that we have to be very careful about whom we reveal delicate parts of our body to and, and that a certain amount of trust is implicit in, in, in that kind of a revealing. And that traces all the way back to the kind of experience that we have in, in, um, in play activities in, in our early childhood. In fact, even the unique punishments and taboos that are associated with sex are entirely learned. You know, where is Geneva Kirk Brooks when we need her? But the point is that, that uh, homosexual activity, the uncomfort that, that a number of people experience with that, is entirely learned. Up until 10 years ago, San Francisco had publicly supported, publicly sanctioned gay paths uh, available. There is precedent going all the way back to Greek and Roman times for, for gay baths. Uh, that activity is reputed also to occur even with the, the, um, in the baths that are still available in modern times in, in Japan. Uh, so that gay activity and, and the discomfort associated with it is largely a matter of, of, uh, of the fact that the physiology and hormones would clearly support it, um, even though our, our experience, our traditions tend not to, tend to discourage it. And finally, even the link between reproduction and sex is learned. There are some very surprised teenagers walking around. Oh, that's where that came from. Woody Allen's summary on masturbation. Don't knock masturbation. It's sex with someone I love. Always liked his approach to life. Far and away, the classic study of, of human sexual activity has been the work of Masters and Johnson that has extended for some 25 years now. And they have actually identified four different stages of the traditional complete sex act. And let's look at each of these just briefly. Um, first of all, with reference to, to females, which are, are far and away the more complex in terms of the possibilities for them in a typical sex act. During excitement, as a female gets excited, Heart rate is increasing, respiration rate is going up, and blood is beginning to flow into the genitals. So that in females, the clitoris is swelling, and in males, the penis is beginning to, to erect. There's an interesting argument between Masters and Johnson and almost everybody else, because they have traditionally labeled foreplay as being in the excitement stage. Almost everybody else's understanding of these four stages suggests that foreplay is actually during the second stage, which Masters and Johnson label as plateau. 
This is now a state of heightened arousal. Blood is continuing to flow into the genitals. In the female, the vagina is expanding. The uterus is rising slightly. And in the male, the glands of the penis, the head of the penis, is, is enlarging. And for both of them, um, lubricating fluids are, are flowing in anticipation of, of intercourse itself. You can actually hold, male and female can be held at this level for an extended period of, of heightened arousal. And one of the, one of the recommended or, or espoused forms of, of sexual activity is simply to walk that very fine line just shy of moving into orgasm for an extended period of time and people who can do that uh, report that it is just as pleasurable as the orgasm itself. So there are a wide range of, of um, sexual activities that, that are feasible given our, our normal um, operating mechanisms, body. At some point then, both the male and the female will move into orgasm, which involves a very intense series of muscular contractions, normally four or five or six, and the expulsion of blood from the genitals back into the bloodstream. But it is the pleasure which is associated with that which, which drives most of, this, um, most of this activity. In the female, with a cooperating and experienced partner and the willingness to do so, she can be extended into a second, indeed multiple orgasms, which with very little additional effort uh, on either his or her part. Um, so multiple orgasms are quite possible and indeed the norm for a, a female who is experienced and who has an experienced uh, partner. And that is followed then by resolution uh, following the last orgasm, which is essentially a reversal of the processes that went on in, in both the excitement and the plateau stage. Um, the old line of, do you smoke after sex? And the response is, uh, I don't know, I'll check next time, is related to that process. One of the problems, I shouldn't say that, this is not a problem. One of the forms of, of sexual excitement and experience that has been reported, not frequently, but enough times to warrant mentioning it, is a pattern in which a female will skyrocket through excitement and plateau to one extended, several minute orgasm, followed by an even more rapid resolution. It's a very rare situation, but it does occur frequently enough to, to warrant mentioning. The only example of this that I know of is in, is in the unedited version of a movie called Network, where one of the newscasters in New York and one of the producers there engage in a complete sex act in about two minutes, start to finish. Uh, and that was very typically what is labeled here, pattern C. It's unusual, uh, but women who are capable of that do report that it is just as satisfying as, as the A pattern, which is by far the most typical pattern. Interestingly, if you ask a male and a female to describe their original experience at intercourse, the male pattern is almost always what is shown here as the, the A pattern for females, not with multiple orgasms, but with a single orgasm. And it describes the four stages very clearly. When you ask the typical female to describe her first pattern, what she describes is an experience where she was brought through excitement to plateau and held and held and held and held, and held, and held, and held, and finally the hell with it. <laughs> and basically the rate of resolution tells you that in fact the sex drive has not been satisfied, and it hasn't. It has been a real exercise in sexual frustration. And where the male normally talks about it as a, as a major, you know, a high point in his life, a female typically describing first intercourse does not describe it that way. It's much more uh, muted and, and, um, and very much less pleasant in terms of the way it's described. The tragedy is, of course, that there are marriages on record that have run six and eight and ten years where the marriage never has been consummated, if you want to talk about consummation as, as joint um, achievement of orgasm. That is unusual, but it is, is more often than not, it's, it's attributable to the lack of experience either on the part of the male or the female, that the, neither of them really understands what they're reaching for in that situation. But, but it's unfortunate that women often get into this um, many times in pattern B before finally moving into the pattern A, which is thankfully the most commonly reported pattern for all uh, females. With males, it's an easy story. One orgasm, Johnny Carson's line pretty well describes it. When he's done, it's done. And that often leads to the, the difficulties with, with um, females reaching orgasm. Um, in the rare instance, a male with a cooperating and experienced partner can be, can be held at plateau and brought back to a second orgasm. Um, you get to three, don't worry about office hours. Let's talk, just come talk to me. 
the question then is, um, what's accounting for this? And, and the, 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 the most common sex advice that is given by sex therapists in order to achieve mutual orgasm is that the male is more easily arousable than the female. She has a long latency period, and there are all sorts of evolutionary reasons why that's probably true. So the advice then is that what you do is to essentially have the female start stimulating the male. Uh, I'm sorry, the male start female stimulating the female before she starts stimulating him and perhaps start five, ten minutes before she starts stimulating him. The point being that then by the end, uh, they can both be brought to, to um, or can achieve essentially mutual orgasm. And there is nothing shy of, of skill to, to lead to the most satisfactory of, of possible sex arrangements. We will hold now then and, and pick up at the beginning of the next lecture with looking at, at um, uh, the learned motives.